Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our online seminar, Do You Need a Graph Database? Thanks, everyone, for coming. We're going to spend about half an hour today and hope you come away with some new intuitions about this old data structure. And with that, let's get started. I'm Sebastian Good, Practice Lead for Architecture and Development at Palladium Consulting, where I work to solve customer problems by applying the right architecture, whether it's new and shiny or old and proven. And with me this morning is my friend Josh Perryman, one of our technical leads and a real data junkie. Palladium Consulting is a software co consultancy focusing on building complex products, whether that complexity comes from intense visualization or user interface requirements, like interactive 3D on multi-touch screens, or very large data sets, applied mathematics, or complex rollouts. We're here in beautiful Austin, Texas this morning, presenting from the offices of our longtime partners in crime, Xperio. Xperio tackles UX design and user research for complex products as well, combining user research techniques and a great library of academically informed interaction patterns to make products usable, efficient, discoverable, and delightful. We've learned over the years that the cleverest and fastest product doesn't get used if it doesn't do things the way users expect, and they've learned that the cleanest product design doesn't mean much without a team that can implement it. So we've had a lot of fun tackling problems together over the years. Thanks for having us. So today we're going to talk about the graph data structure itself. We're going to talk about where graphs show up in the real world, uh, as well as the abstract graphs we make for ourselves. We're going to talk about the kinds of questions graphs are particularly good at solving, uh, how the abstract graph data structure actually works in a graph database as a piece of software. And finally, we'll wrap up with some thoughts on maybe when you should and shouldn't use a graph. So the graph as a data structure is hardly new. It was introduced in the 18th century uh, by a Swiss guy named Euler. But uh, this is what I learned in elementary school. It, a graph took a special kind of paper and colored pencils, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, I understand these days kids are given calculators that rob them of all this joy. But no, really, a graph is just a connection of things connected to other things. It's child's play. Uh, the other day, we were out at dinner, and my daughter asked me what I'd been doing at work before I came home. And I told her we were solving a graph problem for a customer, at which point, of course, I had to explain the whole thing. As fate would have it, her uh, grandparents had just sent us a new sculpture toy made of little sticky strings, which she proceeded to turn into a graph of her school with her teachers and friends and favorite assignments. So what did she figure out? A graph is just things connected to other things. In the mathematical formalism, the thing is called a vertex, one vertex, two vertices. Uh, in more common English, people call them nodes. The connections are called edges or sometimes relationships. So. New York City is connected by rail to Boston. Don't bother with the bus, that's a mess. Jason is connected to Alice through a shared history of being told he can do anything he sets his mind to, but first clean up his room and eat his meatloaf. You can connect different kinds of things. For instance, a retailer noting that a Spider-Man lunchbox is part of the Marvel comic books franchise. Uh, vertices can have many edges. They can participate in many relationships. That lunchbox, is both part of the Marvel franchise and is recommended for ages three to eight. And the links can also go in lots of directions. The Iron Man toothbrush is also part of the same franchise and recommended for the same age range, but only the Spider-Man lunchbox was promoted in this year's back to school sale. So at this point, those of you who have worked with relational databases are probably thinking that except for the odd repeat of the product table, this doesn't look much different than a traditional database diagram. It's an entity relationship diagram and you're right. Graph databases let us define classes of vertices, just like databases let us define tables. Uh, in graph databases, those classes are called labels. Any vertex with the product label will also have a name and a price. Any age range will have a minimum and maximum age. And any recommendation may come with a reason why it was recommended. Uh, most graph databases even let you define cardinality rules for the edges. That is, you can say whether a relationship is one to one or one to many, many to many, and, and so on. So now we have the tools in front of us to answer one of the most typical of graph queries, uh, the recommendation. So let's say you're rendering a web page for the Spider-Man lunchbox and you want one of those, you should also look at these products sections. With the graph query shown at the bottom here, we can say that starting at the Spider-Man lunchbox node on the left, we should follow edges out that are labeled recommended or part of, and then from there follow similar edges in the opposite direction, landing us at a new product, Iron Man toothbrush. We'll figure out it should be recommended because it's from the same franchise and recommended for the same age group. At this point, anyone who's built even the simplest relational database schema is saying, sure, it's a join. Maybe 
It's a four-way join, but it's a join, and my database eats those for lunch. And they're right. There are some reasons a graph database might execute this particular query faster. We'll get to those. But fundamentally, there's not a lot that's new yet here. So let's add another hop. What if we start adding additional information to our graph? Let's say some clever marketer has figured out that the DC Comics franchise is very similar to the Marvel Comics franchise. Now, in addition to making the join through franchise and recommended age, we're also willing to take a join if it's there through the franchise graph to recommend toys from similar franchises. So looking at the graph query on the bottom, you can see that we'll walk through edges until we find related products. In real life, you wouldn't wander around the graph forever. You'd only walk through a certain number of hops. And now that your recommendation engine is such a success, someone went and added sales data to the graph. So now we can recommend products not just because of their properties like the franchise, uh, but because they're also bought by people similar to us, a friend, customer B, uh, or customer C who bought what we bought. Now our query will pick up the water balloons that our friend bought, and it'll pick up Ziploc sandwich bags because someone else who bought our lunchbox also bought those. Uh, so when you start thinking about what kind of SQL you might have to write to accomplish this query, your brain really starts to hurt. You're unioning lots of different length joins and outer joins and common table expressions and recursives. Maybe you've cheated with an Oracle Connect by. And it's at that moment we really hope you pick up the phone and tell us you're ready to think about graph databases. So with that quick tour, we showed you the kinds of graphs you can build when you carry out a typical modeling exercise. And just as we would with a relational database, we build entities and relationships between them, except we call them vertices and edges. And we were able to formulate queries that wandered through the graph. In a few minutes, we'll come to how graph databases work under the covers to execute those efficiently. But first, let's look at some other reasons you might consider a graph. They're already everywhere. Transportation networks are graphs with rails connecting stations and roads connecting cities. You could put this in any kind of database you want, but in real life, it's a real graph. Uh, pipeline networks for oil and gas or transmission lines are graphs connecting wells and refineries or power stations, transformers and homes. And of course, the internet itself is a graph, connecting computers and routers by all manner of networking. But perhaps the most natural graph responsible for this decade's explosion of interest in graph databases is the social network. Which friends are friends with which people? Which people belong to which clubs? Which people called which people? In fact, if you plot the number of, if you plot uh, memberships of people in civic organizations around the time of the American Revolution, You'll no longer why Paul Revere's warnings were heeded so carefully. He wasn't just some dude wandering around on a horse. He was one of the most well-connected people in the colonies, and the government had his eyes on him. This is also how people try to find terrorists or people they should sell to in LinkedIn. Uh, the massive interest in social networks uh, in companies like Facebook and LinkedIn has created a huge tide of research and software in the area that has spilled over uh, to the rest of us. So those are some graphs you find in the real world. There's also graphs that we make up. Uh, if you'd like to lose an hour at work sometime, flowcharts are graphs. I just type pop song flowchart into Google. I lost an hour and wish I hadn't, but you really should try it sometime. <laughs> uh, org charts are graphs because trees are graphs. And trees fit fine in lots of kinds of databases. But in a graph database, we can also model more than one kind of relationship, turning that tree into a graph like modeling that Marsha from accounting actually has the ear of the senior vice president, even though she doesn't report to him. A dependency network is a graph. If you model which tasks require which tasks to come before them, you can figure out what order of operations to take and even when you can do things in parallel. So for one of our clients uh, in the oil and gas space, we built a dependency network of thousands of simultaneous simulations, trying to do a sensitivity analysis, figure out which inputs led to which kinds of outputs. And uh, in the graph, we had to match which inputs had to be fed to which kinds of simulations and which outputs fed further simulations and so forth. And by analyzing this graph of uh, thousands, tens of thousands of nodes, we could merge duplicate steps, save uh, execution time, and also execute lots of operations in parallel. Another one of our clients models IT dependencies in a graph. So this software provides that strategic capability. It's hosted in this server rack, which is in this data center. So now you can quickly answer a question like, which strategic capability do we lose if this data center goes down? And finally, moving to probably the most abstract kind of graph I want to talk about today. It turns out if you build a graph of things that interfere with each other, 
Coloring the graph in so that neighboring nodes don't share colors lets you solve a whole class of very tricky problems. So if each vertex is a class and an edge between two classes indicates that those classes have a common student, then the number of colors you need to color the graph is the number of exam rooms you need, since no student could take two exams at the same time. You could use the same kind of algorithm to match boats into docks or employees with jobs or customers into promotions. And finally, yes, everything in your relational database is a graph. Sometimes you should just leave it there, but sometimes you can do better. So to that point, we're going to talk a little bit about what kinds of questions graphs are particularly good at answering. This picture is a picture of a social network. You can do a kind of whole graph analysis on this uh, record of who's friends with who and who has shared pictures with whom and who was at parties with whom. And it tells you who are the most connected or influential people. The fancy word for this is a centrality analysis. And uh, on the outside, you can find people like me. And uh, there in the center, in those huge circles, you'll find the Kardashians or Kevin Bacon. Perhaps at your company, you have influencers, uh, people writing reviews, people scheduling trips for other people, people buying groceries on behalf of other people, people sharing credit cards. And centrality and importance algorithms will tell you which one of them are the most important for some measure of important. Uh, you know, do they share the same purchases? Do they talk to each other a lot? Uh, perhaps one item in the graph is a cheese plate, and it turns out to be the most predicted, uh, important predictor of wine spend. And it turns out this kind of ranking is also one of the keys to search. So when someone tells you graphs are interesting to search, this is one of the biggest reasons why. If I'm searching a list of people for Kim, there's not much I can do in a traditional database except return all the Kims in the world. And there's a lot of Kims. But if I've calculated an important index, say I'm a social network, I can rank my results by that important index and gamble that most people looking for Kim are more likely to be looking for Kim Kardashian than they are looking for my neighbor, Kim Green. Well, unless I'm looking for Kim, in which case we should also merge information about how close those people are in the graph to me, i.e. how many hops you have to take for me to get to them. And then for me, you might rank Kim Green to the top of my list, but for Josh, you wouldn't. Nothing against you, Josh. She's really very nice. You just haven't met her. I'm sure she's lovely. Yeah. So uh, networks are another kind of graph. Uh, every day we use networks on our phone telling us the fastest way to get somewhere or if there's a traffic jam, how to get around it, um, which police stations will lose power if a transformer fails. People are using graphs every day to solve these problems. But the difference with graph engines today is that they can solve uh, far, far bigger problems than ever before. Millions and millions of interconnected things. Another very uh, important class of questions that graphs can answer are called clustering questions. So some graphs, not all, but some graphs form natural clusters. Uh, these might be parts that will fail together because they're installed near each other physically in an engine or software components that communicate with each other more often than they communicate with others and so are likely to be able to crash each other or maybe parts that were built at similar factories. Uh, or they might be your customers talking to each other more than they talk to other customers or criminals clustering in hotspots or committing fraud in particular patterns. Graphs have been used successfully by journalists looking for corrupt influence or, or by corporate auditors looking for suspicious patterns. And finally, there's a family of algorithms that finds similar graphs. Can you tell us what a typical high end airline travel itinerary looks like? Well, if you can find one, maybe you can match it to others in your same graph. Or can you identify that two purchases or two groups of purchases are probably from the same person or from the same team at one of your clients because they look so similar, even though one came in through a corporate account and the other through a personal account? You can create scores to figure out how similar people are to each other to provide you with fraud detection, cross-selling, upselling opportunities, or even just simple uh, data deduplication. Each of those topics is really uh, an entire lecture's worth of material um, so we just want to provide that quick overview. I hope you can imagine maybe a few use cases for those questions in your own data. With that brief introduction in hand, we'll now talk a little bit about how what you saw actually sits in a graph database and how that may work differently than a relational database. In a relational database, a query engine makes plans that concentrate on scanning through tables, some of which may be indexes, and joining them together. 
that can achieve parallelism, but it can be quite limited. And if your plan doesn't look like this, it's not necessarily going to execute very well. They store everything in tables. And most importantly for our discussion today, that means when you have long join paths across your database like we had, and join paths of varying lengths, you end up wandering all over the disk. Now, if you've got a small database, you're never going to notice this. Everything sits in memory. But if you have billions upon billions of rows, you can very quickly find yourself seeking all over disk. The example we saw were from the Spider-Man lunchbox, we walked up to Marvel and then over to DC and then back to uh, the Superman pillowcase. There's at least seven joins in a typical database, uh, even if they're indexed. The graph database stores roughly the same information, but in a different way. In the graph database, each vertex, each node, is stored as a single document uh, with the vertex and all of its edges, usually inbound and outbound, stored together. Uh, this doesn't mean you have to load all the edges at once. Uh, most graph databases can be particular about which edges they load so that you can have millions and millions of edges. Some engines uh, cope better or worse with very, very large edge counts. Think about how many edges President Obama has on Twitter compared with me, and you might appreciate the magnitude of that problem. But for our same uh, lunchbox to pillowcase query, my graph database is only going to make four hops because it can hop directly from the lunchbox to Marvel because the edge to Marvel is held inside the lunchbox vertex. And similarly, from Marvel, I can jump straight to DC, and then from DC, I can jump straight to the pillowcase. When you start thinking about this join pattern being multiplied over many variable path joins, uh, you can start to see where this locality of reference can make even a database which can be, or excuse me, even a query which can be expressed in graph form and relational form uh, execute faster in, in a graph database. Not all queries will, but ones that do a lot of hopping around will. Uh, to quickly try and illustrate uh, one of the other advantages of a graph database, you can imagine that instead of just wandering through one table, like the products table, and then jumping where you will, you could actually set loose a whole set of agents in your graph. Uh, amusingly, in one of the open source projects that uh, aims to be a common language for graph databases, they call these gremlins. So you can imagine multiple gremlins jumping into your graph, wandering through, following edges, splitting up, joining again to avoid combinatorial explosion. And even in some graph database engines, doing that on multiple machines so that the gremlins can execute inside their portion of the graph and jump from machine to machine so that you can execute a query across a graph that is much, much larger than your primary database. So you can see how even with one machine, I could have potentially hundreds of hardware threads jumping around my database in a way that I just wouldn't attempt in a relational database. And if I'm able to execute this on multiple machines, I may be able to execute a sort of whole graph or, or very expensive query in a highly parallel way that's just not done the same way with a relational database. So graphs are great. They're wonderful. They're stored differently on disk. Let's talk about a few use cases where maybe you shouldn't use them. And to talk about that, I'll hand it over to Josh. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, now that we've oriented ourselves around graph databases, let's look at where you might think of using a graph or you just or the problems that you would not try to use a graph to solve. Uh, these are places or relationships. The first one we want to look at is self-contained data. Um, this is an example from our blog posting from a couple weeks ago. And this is uh, an example of places where relationships or edges or joins really don't factor in your use of the data, particularly when you're querying it. In this case, the primary use case for reading a blog post is reading a blog post. And so when someone accesses the website, what they want to get to as quickly as possible is the content on that page. <clears throat> so what we want to do, the page obviously contains links. The links go to various places. Some of them are referential on the site itself. Some of them are referential to other places or social media places on it. But following the links is not the first or primary thing that we do here. Um, where graph does get interesting is at some point you may want to take a step back and want to know what links are being followed from this page or what uh, blog postings are influencing reading of other blog posting or start doing some things like that. And so while we would 
first want to uh, model this by putting it in a document database and just loading everything that way so we get the, the quickest access. Eventually, we might want to do some analytics. We might want to add a, um, a dynamic view of where the, the blog post is linked to other things. And in that case, um, a graph engine might help us out more in that area. Another place where we would not use graph is the fixed joins. This is a place where we, we use relational databases all the time. You know where you're going to query your data. You have a very strong understanding of the questions you're going to ask. Um, and so there's no ambiguity in terms of where you're going to go in the database or how you're going to get there. Uh, this is perhaps the best question you're going to ask when you're going at this from a modeling standpoint. Do I know how I'm going to query the data? If you're starting with that question, then that will dictate a lot of your data modeling activity on that. Another place that will probably be um, familiar or in the back of the minds of several people here uh, that are on the webcast will be the OLAP systems. This is actually just a special case of the fixed join problem. This is a place where, um, again, you know the questions you want to ask, or at least you have a very good idea of what those questions are, and so you're able to pre-compute or predetermine those joins. There's very little ambiguity in terms of the questions you're going to be asking um, with regards to that. And this gets into one of the things that we feel is really important uh, to keep in mind when you're evaluating a graph database technology. It's still a very young technology. There's a lot of work to do, and Palladium's very excited about being involved in the work in terms of enhancing the, the graph database systems and being working in that area. But we're playing catch up with the relational databases. There are decades and millions of person hours that are involved with relational databases that are invested in those ecosystems. There's a lot of tooling that already exists uh, out there. And in a lot of cases, starting with a relational database makes great sense. One, because your developers know it already. They're familiar with that environment. And two, there's just great tools out there to help you in the management, the construction, the, the growing and feeding of your relational databases. So there are some signs. Um, as we're bringing this to a close, I want to sum up for you. We're going to talk for, um, I want to hit, highlight some of the signs that you might need a graph database. For those of you that are coming at this from a very technical point of view, if your problems that you're encountering on a day-to-day -day basis fall in one of these three areas, here are some good indications that graph might be a good fit for you. If you're writing a lot of dynamic SQL, where you're thinking, first I'm going to join to table A, and then I need to join to table B under some circumstances, and so I need to create a dynamic SQL query to handle that ambiguity that I'm going to face at a runtime, that's an excellent point where now you need to think, Maybe I need a better tool for handling that runtime ambiguity for making that type of decision. Another example would be where I don't need exact precise answers, but I need fuzzy answers. I'm trying to match closeness of shape of things. Um, this is where the recommendation engines work in really well. Um, and some of those other algorithms that are, work great in the graph database for determining the match of the, the path to the database. Finally, and this is from a modeling standpoint, if you find yourself having to deal with the relationships in your data with greater sophistication than you normally would, oftentimes we're focused on the endpoints and the tables and we're querying the endpoints of the tables, but sometimes we need to start evaluating that, hey, this relation, this, there are two types of relationships between these entities, and I'm going to label one relationship um, <clears throat> purchases and the second relationship desires and I need to handle those things differently, but I'm still working with those two things. If relationships are at the point of becoming a first order citizen, in a sense, within your data model, this is a great example for where you would start looking at graph databases. Switching gears from the less technical to the more business oriented side, um, if you are talking about how things are connected more than the things themselves, this is a great time for you to talk to your technical people and ask them if graphs make sense. If this kind of explosion of things and you're really focused on the relationship and makes sense for you, that's how you're discussing items in your domain, then this is start looking at graph. The other thing, just look at the areas that we talked about before. Uh, the centrality analysis. If we're trying to figure out who's important in an environment or what's important there. The um, influencers, or if you're looking for search improvement, if you're looking at clustering or that fuzzy matching, those kind of use cases, all of those things work together um, <clears throat> to fit very nicely in a graph data engine. And this is a point where I'm not going to turn it back to Sebastian uh, as we wrap things up and look to taking some questions. Graphs are a ton of fun. 
we think they're fun. There's a whole lot more to learn than we were able to go over in this little half hour. But uh, we'd love to hear from you if you guys have uh, any questions or comments.